Good evening, and welcome to Abominable Abominations, a turn-of-the-century horror podcast presented by me, Thomas Barker. Tonight, we interrupt our usual programming to bring you a discussion that I hope you'll find interesting. My guest today is an independent researcher with a background in contemporary philosophy, MA, and film. She also has several publications in the cross-section of film and philosophy, one of which is on the subject of cosmic horror. Welcome to the show, my colleague from the dark cosmos, Tiana Pitkovska. Okay, so the the reason I really wanted to um, uh, ask you to come on and, and have a bit of a chat is because I know beyond beyond being a, a marvelous uh, short story and uh, scenario writer for the Dark Cosmos, you also have, Thank you. uh, and you're very welcome, you also have an academic background. So it's definitely something that I am very interested in, but from a strictly, um, you know, an amateur amateur level so yeah i you know but it is something that i want to um engage with and in addition to with with the podcast with abominable abominations and i've mm-hmm. decided again terra it's a terrible name and i'm thinking what's going to happen is it's it's going to eventually kind of like in a sort of um in a like a lovecraftian sense it's going to devolve and decay and the name is going to become increasingly less sensible as time goes on i think that's what i'm going to do and it's just going to that's, eventually, i think that's great yeah mm, a series let it have its own life absolutely yeah become a series of syllables that no one technically should be able to pronounce with human tongue yeah anyway uh, but, but i still kind of like actually your name i great. can't come up with any name so sweet <laughs> in addition to to sort of you know recording basically just stories that i I would like to hear that that sort of intrigue me. I'm interested in not only that sort of turn of the century time period where there was such a ferment of um of horror and 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 a, and a real you know kind of literary movement. But yeah, so so to but to also to engage in you know a bit more of an academic level or or a, an an analytic level without killing the without you know there's that old story about um. Di- you know, dissect explaining a joke is like dissecting a frog. Nobody laughs, and the frog dies. And I feel like sometimes, if you if you investigate things too, you know, too coldly, then you lose some of that interest. But who cares about that? So here's a question for you: What I have a slightly different opinion, but oh, okay, briefly... please, please, absolutely. I've been yapping on. Please go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I agree with you that sometimes if you do dissect a joke, it stops being funny. And uh, uh, one of the reasons why I told you that Noel Carroll, uh, the the author and philosopher Noel Carroll, isn't as interesting to read uh, about horror than actually reading horror is because he does just that. However, mm. I think that certain authors and theoreticians and philosophers do uh, uh, not necessarily an analysis that is as objective and cold as you might expect, but is it uh, in itself a kind of... Um, work of art because it's full with a lot of passion and experience and thought that uh, isn't only meant to dissect but to kind of be an active participant within this kind of uh, either fiction or philosophical ideas or whatever so I think it's a more complicated question than just calling it a dissection and putting everything bluntly and making horror stop being scary or jokes stop being funny. So I, I, that's, yeah, I think that's a marvelous point. It, 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 it leads you into a deeper appreciation, um, Absolutely, you know, yes. without that necessarily the elitism that the idea of deeper might entail, but no, I, I agree wholeheartedly. That's a wonderful um, yeah. anal- um, summing up of that there. Okay. The idea of, of horror, um, you know, it's, it's something that's, it is ubiquitous in in art. Maybe in a way that's not the question to ask, and really it's just a jumping off point. Mm-hmm. But it's it's something that evokes a sense of fear, right? It's it's the age old fight or flight response. I mean, is that essentially what we're dealing with at the very kind of the nub the nub of it? Um, yes, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, that's the the simplest way, yes, to explain horror is to explain it as uh, something that elicits uh, fear, right, Uh, as a genre. Uh, Mm. uh, The experience of fear is its main nub, as you said, right? Yeah. However, I think that uh, in the 20th century, especially, uh, the dimensions of horror have been kind of 
uh, reanalyzed, reinterpreted, subverted even to kind of elicit other kinds of emotions and not just stick with fear as the main one. So uh, the feelings of something being odd, uncanny, strange, unsettling, which is not necessarily the, the feeling of fear in its full scope, right? What we mm. would expect uh, in, in horror, uh, I think gives uh, the genre itself a, a much more interesting and more open kind of playground so that it can go into different directions, including cosmic horror or even in ghost stories sometimes so exactly I, th I yeah i mean you know no notes of fear or even even something like a a, a, sense, a sense of being unsettled or even nausea mm -hmm. or alienation yeah i mean and we see this you know in its sort of most like broad or crass expression in certain mainstream films like comedies especially where you know mm -hmm. something there might be a note of the yeah of this of the sort of slightly unsettling or you know and i often find that there is a, a thin line sometimes, I have to think of some specific examples, between something that is funny and something that is that is unsettling or frightening, for lack of a better word. You know, sometimes it, okay. is, the, it is the thinnest of lines where one thing can turn into the other. And I mean, that is a whole fascinating psychological, you know, rabbit hole that you could delve down into that I probably Absolutely. don't have the... <laughs> I probably don't have the like uh, the intellectual tools to do so, but I think that's a good. I don't know if I have the emotional bandwidth. That's also important, I guess. That's yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, that's a whole fascinating topic too. Is like, why do yeah. we engage with something that that normally we would, you know, okay. be hardwired to avoid? I mean, that's you know, that's a fascinating question. Is it you know, is it that small Definitely. doses of it inoculate us from the broader? Yeah, no, that's an interesting one. I'd be very interesting to talk about that sometime too. Well, I think we've sort of dwelt with with horror and not just kind of reducing it to the you know the rattling of chains, which even and the ghost in the in the churchyard, which even mm -hmm. at the beginning of the twentieth century was probably a fairly hoary kind of hoary h o a r y. I mean, uh, sort of trope. Proceeding from horror and bearing in mind the work that you and I have been involved in with the dark cosmos, um, and hopefully, okay. who knows in the future with with abominable abominations, whether it sinks into obscurity or whether I get to serialize a few more interesting old stories, but specific elements of horror, you know, styles, feelings that that get evoked, and so obviously cosmic horror is a term that gets bandied about, but the element of the supernatural versus psychological, and I know mm -hmm. that's an interesting distinction to make uh, within horror. Would you mind um, touching on that a little bit too? Of course, uh, I think that um, it's not as easy to draw that line either, as sure. much as uh, the thing we spoke pre uh, spoke about previously. But uh, what I think is most important is how we actually understand supernatural or psychological horror, because both can have elements of the other, just as anything else can. Sure. Uh, I don't necessarily think that supernatural uh, horror can be something that completely uh, is devoid of uh, the psychological elements of what uh, 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 the characters or the even the audience then feels. If I understood your question correctly, yeah. By the way, well, maybe I, I'm I just mean, no, going no, off no. On some in some other direction that you didn't. No, I actually mean. mean to to maybe to maybe like avoid um needing to because I realize like with any any discussion especially pared down as as this one will be, of I, I certainly don't want to force like force you into making any kind of sweeping statement or you know yeah. broad strokes because that is I know I find that really frustrating myself too um but also bearing in mind that. Uh, you know, there's always going to be little nuances that will unfortunately be lost. Yes, because I think it's interesting you say, you know, the the idea of of human intelligence or of mind. I mean, that's another whole ph philosophical idea is about uh, right is about reality itself. There always has to be our engagement with, with the universe, yeah, and with yeah, that and which is cosmically whatever horrible, reality right? is. Yeah, so I I completely so take I, your I point about think that, psychological. Uh, in this uh, uh, sense of the word, cosmic horror isn't a void of psychological horror. No. In fact, very often uh, the horror within the co within cosmic horror is the psychological and even the kind of 
uh, let's call it epistemological meaning, something that uh, pertains to the knowledge, the understanding yes. of the human being, right? Because that's mm -hmm. one of the, its main facets, let's say, as a, as a genre. The way that uh, knowledge or understanding can be broken by something that is horrible within cosmic horror and supernatural horror is really something that also breaks eventually the psyche and it does speak a lot to the psyche of, of the human, right, as a species and how connected uh, our sense of self, of understanding of self, of feeling of, of self is with our knowledge and understanding. So uh, in that sense, I don't really think there's a distinction between supernatural and psychological horror, unless we imagine psychological horror just as something that, uh, as something that happens just in the mind or just in the psyche or whatever you would call it. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, whatever it is that is that is horrific about, you know, the the, the human experience, if we're talking about a specific um, narrative or a story, mm -hmm. it must, uh, because devoid of any kind of psychological impact on the person, it sort of, it, it gets drained away. I mean, it would be interesting to try and envision what, a horror story without any kind of psychological element would be i don't know would it be would it be a horror story at all uh right well i think there's also like a double way of seeing that if, mm. uh in the way uh do you intend uh the horror to uh, be felt by the characters within your story or your right. uh audience members for example sorry to jump in for example yeah, say so, you know uh, something like the description of the the eventual heat death of the universe you know that so entropy everything sort of winds down and eventually we're just kind of left, you know, described even in cold, dispassionate scientific terms. And eventually there is no, um, you know, the, 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 the stars, you know, have ceased to, to their chemical reactions. The mm -hmm. universe has expanded and, and eventually there's just this vast lightless void. I mean, I suppose that's a horrific idea, right? But there's no it's element funny. of, yeah, and that leads you to interrogate i guess why it is horrific yeah absolutely yes mm. i think that um maybe i do intellectualize horror a little bit uh, uh more than i actually uh understood until this particular point when you asked this question or made this uh, observation personally i do find the heat death of the universe pretty terrifying because mm. uh, be simply because i cannot fully imagine it you know, mm. simply because it's that complex of a situation that my brain cannot fully process it. So I think this actually goes to speak a lot about cosmic horror and what actually it, it means. So in a way, the heat death of the universe is in, in itself a cosmic horror event, which will maybe, if the scientists are right, happen, right, eventually mm. to our own reality. But, uh, I mean, I, I, I personally believe in that particular theory, not uh, any others. But uh, my point was that if we think of cosmic horror not just as uh, a kind of simplistic fear response uh, to something that is simply huge or ugly, or I'm speaking of uh, uh, concretely about beings like Cthulhu or sure. you know something that appears in Lovecraft particularly but something that's scary like the color out of space because the color out of space isn't even a color we don't know what it is yeah it's something a phenomenon that might not even be organic that might not even be intelligent or we, we have n absolutely no idea what this thing is and in itself by not knowing that's what fear that scares us in a way it's um right? it's... not just the the reactions that people eventually have to the color and they mutate and do whatever and it's disgusting and all of those things you know what i mean absolutely well i think it's if i remember that um the uh conference you sent me with st and i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing his name joshi joshi he specifically... i don't know how to pronounce it yeah either, i'll so. i'll check that and i'll i'll just put in a, a seamless um uh Absolutely. version of me saying it and no one will be any the wiser but but joshi says right that the whole point is the the entity itself isn't malignant by any way that we as people humans could measure it's it's not mm -hmm. evil it doesn't have any kind of agenda but its mere presence is so antithetical is not the word but but is so at odds in a way with our understanding I actually of like concept. like uh, like uh, defining it as antithetical because okay. Absolutely. It is antithetical to everything we know. 
right? Mm, okay, sure, yeah. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, it's, continue. It, no, yeah. So it's at right angles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, listen, I think that the reason why cosmic horror is so interesting and so interesting to kind of be delved into in a philosophical mm, and mm. an aesthetic way is because it does allow you to pose this these questions, which are yeah. very complicated. Uh, and yeah. it does that with the ease of ease in quotation marks uh, mm. of fiction, right? Mm. Because not necessarily in philosophy, we can always be that open with asking these questions. And we have to kind of always seek for the uh, an explanation of the inexplicable, maybe not mm. in the same way as science does, but uh, uh you know, we don't we don't uh, have the opportunity to use our imaginations in the same way, even though we do use a kind of philosophical imagination in the same way that uh, uh, writers do. Sure, there's so, there's logic, and you have theories of of induction and all these kinds of. There of are course, still there are still tools. Of course, you have to be mm. like super careful about kind of maintaining the tradition of quoting every single philosopher <laughs> that has talked about it yeah. throughout entire history of humankind, yeah. but also. Yeah. Uh, we um, even if you do leave a question open and ambiguous, uh, because it is a little bit removed, philosophy is a, a little bit removed from creating an, a, a kind of experience within its readers. It can't itself be cosmic horror, but cosmic horror leaving uh, uh, something ambiguous, it, it has it, it has it. It's like it, it's like it's full right to do it. I don't know if I'm making any sense in this kind of. Uh, comparison I, no i think so and i think the totality of what you're saying will make sense because man there's so much more to cover which is really exciting i have a bit of a quote here and whether or not this might put a, a bit of a button on the idea of of getting to grips with some definitions of cosmic horror mm -hmm. so to quote hp lovecraft <laughs> and that's not the first time i'm going to say this i'll try not to make it too sort of too Do it, please. um so he says in the essay, um, Supernatural Horror in Literature, he's defining what he calls the weird tale. So we'll take that as as being supernatural or, or even cosmic horror to an extent. But he's saying, you know, these are the qualities. And he says, a malign and particular suspension or defeat of those fixed laws of nature, which are our only safeguard against the assaults of chaos and the demons of unplumbed space. Now, I feel like <clears throat> that covers... That's a, a fairly good summation of of some certain points that we've that we've just talked about, or you specifically have talked about. Yeah, cool. And then the other thing he says, which is is maybe more in terms of the craft of of the work, atmosphere is the all important. And this we maybe will I'll mention this now, but maybe we'll return to this when we're talking about specific instances of of horror and cosmic horror. Um, so this might be a, a leading off point, but atmosphere is the all important thing. For the final criterion of authenticity is not the dovetailing of a plot, but the creation of a given sensation. Should we talk about atmosphere now, or should we just um, go back a little bit to fixed laws of nature? Yeah, and... let's because we've only got five more minutes. So if we, yeah, mm -hmm. if we if we go back, and then we might get interrupted halfway through, and then we'll start again right. and see how we go. The fixed, yes, the fixed laws of nature being suspended or disrupted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, no, what I what I meant to say is, uh, so if we see cosmic horror as uh, metaphysical horror, then yes, of course we can talk about the laws of the fixed laws of nature being disrupted or suspended. However, if we actually take another look, and this this comes back to what I said before, if we take another look at uh, cosmic horror and see it from the kind of uh, psychological understanding, knowing kind of side of things. Then just for it's our, not um, really sorry, sorry, just just for sorry. just for the sake of the listeners, metaphysics being like the the, the nature of reality, right? Right, absolutely. Mm, cool. So, so uh, it, it's not the nature of reality that's maybe in question, mm. but maybe it's the way we understand the nature of reality, okay, and we sure. see those uh, laws of nature being broken or suspended or yada yada, just because we right. simply do not know what causes such an effect mm. around us, right? Yeah, and that leads, I think, into some interesting questions about the genre itself. So moving mm -hmm. away a little bit from the broader uh, philosophical and um, psychological ideas about the genre as a whole, but more into the concrete business of how it arose, its origins, where it got started, to a more sort of slightly cozier topic, 
we've brought up H.P. Lovecraft before, which is a name I think probably most of the of the myriad of listeners to this podcast will will recognize at the very least, um, because there is a certain not I wouldn't say massively widespread, but fairly well, you know, there's there's a certain amount of pop cultural um knowledge about Cthulhu, you know, all the way down to like strange anime dating sims with like yeah, I mean, don't ask me how I know about these things. I just, you know, it's 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 a purely um professional Listen, we all have our corners of the <laughs> internet and our particular I, like so yeah no no judging. it's i'm aware of this from from it's it, i'm actually see the problem is now i've raised like the specter of this no it is actually genuinely and from a like professional you have to explain it. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. I, and in so doing so and in doing it. so it sounds much worse no but okay so so hp <laughs> lovecraft he's sort of a guy probably people might know he's he's american new england rhode island specifically um early 20th century and he is you know sort of one of the big standout figures and he himself did a great deal to kind of codify and create cosmic horror as a sort of a genre but it goes back earlier than that um i at least i as as far as i understand it does so would you mind can you give a quick outline if if you are willing or able as to you know the kind of various strands or ideas of cosmic horror throughout the throughout the long centuries i somehow have a feeling that you probably know more about this than i do because i wasn't uh, like i'm aware of certain uh thematic uh similarities with the uh, horror that existed pre pre lovecraft of course but hmm. Barely... like i haven't uh delved into the history right. the development of cosmic horror that much so mm. the only thing I, I guess i can say is that uh i don't know uh, of course all the writers by name but um or, or the most important ones uh when it comes to uh, lovecraft's personal influences right mm. but we can mention uh authors like edgar Allan poe of course and even uh certain nautical stories and uh uh joseph conrad with his particular way of telling stories and how mm. maybe that influenced lovecraft and cosmic horror later on maybe mm. even more i mean you're quite right and and especially with with someone like edgar Allan poe who i mean just over storytelling i i always i probably shouldn't really i you know hesitate to say the word literature but it is it is actually a very useful word it just has connotations but yes of of we're of, just afraid of the elitist aspect yeah, of what I sh- saying literature would mean, yes so, yes yeah. yeah okay i should give myself okay. permission not to be afraid um <laughs> um yeah exactly. listen the more people talk about it the more people understand it the less elitist it becomes so that's a marvelous right. summation. That's yes, words to live by indeed. Exactly. Cool. So yeah, so I mean it yes, Ed Allan Poe looms large and he, you know, he's not only because he has this um as a as a person, he he, you know, he's almost got this sort of Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh, depending you know, how you want to pronounce you know, this yeah. idea of the tortured artist, un um celebrated in his own lifetime, who nonetheless you know, is hugely influential. I mean, even H.P. Lovecraft himself has has some of that. You know, that that story, and of course, that's Supposedly. a rom- yeah, that's a rom- a romantic notion which doesn't always bear up to scrutiny. But nonetheless, it, it's a powerful idea. Yeah, I mean, my sort of brief understanding of of tripping tripping sort of back through the ages of perceived roots of cosmic horror, obviously go all the way back to myth- mythological ideas um mm-hmm. and you know in the at least the tradition that i'm a bit more familiar with you know going back to i mean you can't sort of you can't get away from things like the odyssey obviously um yeah. absolutely no 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 now that now that you say it i absolutely mm. understand what you mean uh kind of seeing it in a very broad sense of very the very broad but there are specific absolutely. instances i mean things like um, i actually like that that kind of perspective of cosmic horror seeing it that broadly and so please continue this is well, very interesting. No, <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, and that's the great thing is you can, I mean, it's the wonderful thing about, you know, our only enemy is time, right? As humans, we can, Absolutely. as long as you're open to all ideas, we can take that lens and, you know, widen it out and see the macroscopic and the microscopic. But, you know, I think coming from Homer and then things like the, um, I mean, 500 years later, you've got, uh, what's it, the metamorphosis, Ovid. Um, uh-huh, right, right, right. You know, and again, uh, this to, to oh, people that's, who are... uh, that's a body gore meets cosmic e- horror. Exactly. Meets, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And and it's it's a bit of an easy one because it's it's also a pretty familiar sort of story for 
students of literature anyway and the idea of the novel itself it, it's kind i suppose it is worth actually kind of it's an interesting thing to think about in that the earliest examples of what we call or of what is sometimes called the novel and i realize this is contentious because you know people get all uh, argumentative about whether it was daniel defoe or whatever but you know things like like the early roman long form narratives of that that survive anyway like like the golden ass and um the metamorphosis and even satyricon um you know has elements of like you say but body horror specifically i mean we'd frankly a lot of the stuff that's in you know in in ye oldie times would would even make people from our day sort of blush as to the kind of the earthiness of it right um Definitely. anyway and so we've always been depraved as uh, absolutely creatures and <laughs> yeah and now we also want to think that aliens or gods or whatever are depraved so we kind of but uh, uh, on the other hand i have to say that if um, we do go back to mythology we have to mm. understand that especially in, in the greeks and the romans there was mm. such a um, anthropomorphizing of the gods and right. uh, the creatures where they describe these kind of uh, situations and scenarios which would make us blush right but uh, in cosmic horror what's interesting is that uh, the other or that which is unknown is actually mm -hmm. something that's either opposite or completely completely different than what is human so mm. yes that's a very good point and so it is not a Yes, and I think that's also interesting to return at some point to the the mm -hmm. essay by Lovecraft, where he talks, he very specifically invokes science and technology and, you know, the ideas of understanding and as, you know, as, um, yes, and, and to go back to your idea of, of the color out of space of something that is, yes, completely unknowable. Yeah, so that's a very good point to make. So that's that. kind of like both the philosophy of cosmic yeah. horror, but it's also part of, I think, uh, its themes is like its ideas and part of, part of almost like the canon of what mm. makes cosmic horror cosmic horror which is uh extreme anti-anthropocentrism and anti-anthropomorphism mm. and even anti-humanism which are three completely different ideas but they kind of come bundled together within cosmic horror and that's eventually i think what makes it so interesting and, and special compared to other forms of cosmic horror because even in ghost stories that which is unfamiliar and scary and beyond is still something that kind of belong to the world of the human and yes. it still has some kind of humanly shape right or uh had at least to be connected to that's a very very good point that we shouldn't necessarily go looking for oh wow this this idea or this genre or this this literary expression Oh, it's actually way, you know, some things genuinely are, are new, even if they may reach back into, you know, uh, half forgotten, you know, um, collective unconscious memories or whatever. Yes, some things <laughs> develop oh, as genres really and are new. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, yeah. Um, specifically in talking about the evolution of the genre, the idea of evoking an atmosphere, um, which was much more mm -hmm. consciously developed. You know, you've got goth gothic horror. The genre itself then, shall we say, you know, as it, as it sort of becomes established, and this is maybe this, I, I think we can be a little bit kind of a little bit flippant here or, um, you know, list off if you if you if you can or wish to what you would sort of consider some of the kind of the standard tropes, if you will. OK, here's here's an exercise, actually. Now I think about it. If you were if you sat down and was like, I'm going to write the most cliched, hacky cosmic horror story. What would right. you what would you throw into that mix? Depending on again, like even in Lovecraft, you can find different versions of cosmic horror and how you wanna you wanna play mm. with it. But let's say you have a lost civilization that was once a great civilization of alien creatures, uh, far beyond uh, that had capabilities technological or I don't know even biological maybe mm. beyond uh, what humans are capable of at the moment. And I bet that this civilization would be stumbled across by, I don't know, a team of researchers from a university, perhaps? 
Absolutely. I just wanted to say that uh, researchers, surveyors, uh, I think journalists, even maybe a detective that's researching a murder. Mm. And then he finds a cult that leads him to a kind of specific place. Oh, maybe, that's good too. Or maybe it's right? a, the, yeah. the Call of Cthulhu kind of <laughs> yeah. uh, trope. So it's always, uh, but I think actually what I find most interesting about Lovecraft's specific way of telling uh, cosmic horror stories is that he kind of always does it in first person or almost always, maybe I'm, I'm not completely right about that, but it's a first person narrative, but it's always like once removed from the actual. Right. Yes. Someone it, describing right? a person they know or they've met. Yes. I mean, I'm thinking yeah, like yeah, yeah. Pick Pickman's model. So or, yeah. 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 Even color out of space. I mean, mm. I'm sorry that that one is the freshest in my memory. That's why I keep returning. No, to it. great. I mean, it's it's such an influential one. So no, I think that's that's yeah. a good. Mm. And even like the shadow out of time, which is my particular favorite one. Uh, the character kind of experiences the world of these aliens, powerful creatures, whatever, through the mm. body of an alien by jumping back in time. Oh, into that's his, his body. You know, and it's uh it's still kind of once removed because he's not really there to be hurt, get hurt. But mm. then again, uh, his psyche might be influenced so much that he will get mad and he does get mad in his own time in reality, right? Mm. Okay, so we've got a team of, of, of hapless sort of civilian researchers usually. Um, right, right. Uh, intellectual, inqu inquiring, sensitive usually. They're often... I mean, obviously, it's you know, if we're if we're thinking about cliches, you know, you want someone who's sensitive because then it's easier for them to go mad. Um, yeah, but it's and, more interesting to make the rational one mad. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But we're not interested. That's what we're. Well, yeah, we're, we're interested we're going in with what the tropes. We're the, yeah, 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 just the lowest common denial. I mean, extra points, of course, if they happen to be from Miskatonic University. Um, Absolutely, yes. <laughs> I mean, the shared universe thing. I'll we'll get to that because that's kind of interesting just from uh, like a, the idea of a fandom, I think is actually, you know, cause it's really a proto, yeah, definitely. definitely a proto fandom developing with their letter writing circle and people like, um, oh, who's the main guy, August Derleth. Okay. Yeah. Now I think I, I understand what you mean. Yeah. I, I also understood in a wider kind of sense of the word. Oh, sure. That yeah. it becomes a fandom. Like you can even put Stephen King in the, inside the fandom. Oh, absolutely. Of because he's written stories within that universe or new mm. game. And I think he's even done that. So. Oh, Alan Moore. I mean, every, loads and loads. Right. Of people. Right. Yeah. yeah. Especially um, in comics. I think it's even more, I, I, I don't know that much about comics, but I feel like. Which is an interesting. Even... Yeah. Which yeah, is sorry. fascinating when you think about it, because con comics in a way are even more representational, you know, than, mm -hmm. than, you know, at least with writing, you can describe something that is beyond comprehension. And yet in a comic, you literally have to depict Mm. Actually, that's very interesting that you mentioned that coming back to the tropes and to the kind of uh, mm. canons of of uh, cosmic horror that you never really truly describe that which is so terrifying. And mm. you're even once removed from that as well, even yeah. though there's kind of a joke about uh, Lovecraft that he never he uh, always says how indescribable something is. And then he kind of still proceeds to describe it <laughs> in words. So, yeah. There's like a usually a kind of a, and this is doing it a disservice, but you know tentacle, yeah. tentacles, tentacles, tentacles inevitably crop up. Um, yes. My favorite, I think, is it from the Mountains of Madness. The term squamous mass is just a great phrase. I absolutely, it's, yeah. It's, it's one unfortunately one seldom. Wait, there gets. was were they descendants or were they like the, creations? The, yeah, creations. You're quite right. They're the. Um, Oh, uh, Yogoth. No, Sugar, 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 Shogoth. Oh, Shogoth. Shogoth. Yeah, Shogoth. Shogoth. Yeah. Shogoth. Yeah. There we go. Cool. So ancient civilization, probably in some out of the way place. I mean, again, Antarctica, a ju the, the, the jungle. It, it must be cold. No, it, it must be either cold or super dense like the jungle, but it can never be like a desert, right? No, which is interesting. It's too open. Yeah, right. I guess I suppose so. But then again, um, uh, thingy Al Hazaret was was an Arab, so you know. Aha! Uh -huh, right, right, right. The, necro the Necronomicon was, was conceived of in a mind that existed within that part of the world. Alternative history, because you mentioned uh, uh, the Necronomicon, yeah. right? Mm. There's always a book. There's always some kind of alternative history. Uh, there's always some kind of reference 
uh, 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 or like footnote to something that doesn't exist in our world, but it's does a, in this universe. It's a thread, right? You pull it, you know, right, especially right. if it involves some kind of ancient document, you find, you know, this little thread of, oh, this is strange in a library somewhere. And, you know, you tug on that thread. I mean, especially I'm thinking more of like with the Call of Cthulhu, right? If uh, It's been a while mm -hmm. since I've read that. You've got the various cults. Okay. There's going to be, a, there's a cult probably at some there's, point. A yes, cult, A cult, I should say, sorry, my terrible New Zealand accent. A cult. Um, That's the one thing I must say that-, that no, I'm sorry, but mm. the more you repeated it, I just kept hearing occult, occult. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> it just got worse, so I'm sorry. Uh, uh, anyways, cult. Yeah, yeah, but so there's a cult or even the occult. <laughs> yes. At the yep. same time. Preferably both. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not necessarily in the same story, but you've got uh, some kind of ancient... It exists somewhere there. Of course. Ancient bloodline, right? That's another, mm -hmm. you know, ancient bloodline that has, that whilst being possessed of some secret knowledge or power has maybe somehow degenerated. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And with all the implications that might have. That's, Absolutely. I mean, that that's another one that's, I mean, they're all, I mean, all these have just come straight out of Lovecraft stories, of course. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting thinking about something, say, you know, like The King in Yellow, for example, a book, the Necronomicon being the most famous that appears and disappears throughout history. And, um, you know, oh, right, like some... a fictitious book that holds mm. some kind of knowledge that will either give you infinite power or drive you mad. Or... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, it, you know, yeah. I mean, especially in the man like the way it manifests in those evil dead movies. Have you seen any of those? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of <laughs> like the most, you know, just the most of like, oh, you read the words, but something terrible like happens. It's campy and beautiful yeah. and amazing. Oh, absolutely. No, I love uh, Evil Dead 2 is wonderful and, and Bruce Campbell can do no wrong. Um, absolutely. What, I mean, what are the other... I mean, we've also just talked about them and talking about the genre in general. I would, would even you... throw in stuff like uh, there needs to be a portal maybe of a sort, mm. a lighthouse, a church... The portal in the church or the lighthouse. <laughs> you know, not 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 in every story, but definitely there are a few few out there yes. that have that kind of as a trope. The yes, ruins lead trope. yes, and yeah. either something detail. Yeah, I guess. yeah. 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 it's it's, it's tr tricky not to use that word. Um, mm. yes, possibly some building. I mean, of course, there's there's truth and uh, there's there's a reality to this. You know, sites of worship or. Yes, sacred mm -hmm. sites get built on over the years. I mean, how many times, you know, do, do modern day Christian churches get excavated only to find, you know, pagan, well, to use that word, pagan or, or non-Christian um, symbolism? Mm. Way, yeah, you, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I come from part of the world where that's like you dig a little bit and you find a church and then you dig a little bit more and then you find some kind of temple from ancient times and then, yeah. you do and then there's like a, a horse burial or maybe or on top of the church there was like a mosque when the ottomans mm. were here so that's like layers of layers of layers of history of sacred space and whatnot that reminds me um again about what you said earlier regarding the interweaving and uh, and uh, porous nature of the, of the scary stories of the, the horrific. Yes, I think that, uh, I mean, like all genres, horror, of course, finds uh, different ways of expressing, or rather different expressions. And uh, we don't necessarily find them uh, in fear mm. all the time, but in, in feelings and uh, not necessarily emotions, because fear is the emotion, and feelings that are maybe not as strong as fear or maybe don't, uh, cause that fight or, or flight response, but still uh, create a kind of atmosphere to go back to the idea of the atmosphere. The creation of a world that's just a little bit offbeat, just a little bit not the world we know mm. as is. So previously, uh, uh, in like previous inter iterations of horror, it was always the, I, I think this actually uh, goes back to the understanding of the sublime and the terrible mm. in the 18th and the 19th century. And uh, everything that uh, causes uh, fear or uh, the flight, uh, uh, fight or flight response and the, 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 the uh, causes you to uh, feel the need for self-preservation is mm. was I think maybe the basic and most uh, uh, best way to uh, go into horror 
I mean, that's the opening line of that essay, right? The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. Um, I Absolutely. Think. And now mm. as we go through time and as we discover many other things in the 20th century, especially, we discover that uh, many things can make us feel weird and mm. many things can make us feel uh maybe not necessarily scared for our lives, but scared for our identities. Uh, not just identity in a political sense, but identity in a psychological sense as well. So mm. uh, I think that cosmic horror can ev evoke these uh, feelings or, uh, in us as well. And, and I think that in newer iterations of cosmic horror, if I can uh, just uh, talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. I think that actually these feelings are much more prevalent than the actual terror of losing your life or being transformed or into a hideous creature or whatever, because these are actually stories now more about what it means to be human, what it mm. means to be a specific kind of human in a specific place, and uh, what our technology now means, what we can see and discover about the universe. So... I think this is most prevalent in, for instance, Jeff Vandermeer's uh, Southern Ridge trilogy. Right. I think he's a little bit of one of the more famous uh, cosmic horror writers today, even though yeah. I don't think he would call himself a cosmic horror writer necessarily. But no. uh, so specifically, that the, the one of his books was adapted as that Netflix film Annihilation, right? Right, right. Mm. And Annihilation itself speaks about uh, not just the annihilation of kind of humankind, but what humankind is made of. Mm. So in a, in a sense, um, or, or the way Alex Garland, for instance, describes it, he said, he says something like, I'm paraphrasing, of course, uh, that the way he understood the annihilation of, of the novel is, is an, an annihilation of identity, mm. you know, annihilation of, of it, and it can even be self-annihilation through, you know, uh, uh, substance abuse or self-loathing or whatever you can imagine right that it does stem from the psychological aspect of humankind but is instigated by something else that is so other that create that creates this kind of scenario for us to start to kind of um seeing ourselves in a different way or searching deep within ourselves to find our true identity, maybe not finding it and fighting with it. Yeah, that's, that's what I have to say about that. I'm sorry if I got a little bit, uh, if I talked a little bit more about the subject than previously or explained it differently. Not at all. No, I was just, I wanted to um, not, not just jump in on that because um, that's, brought up an interesting idea or well, it's brought up an idea I shouldn't <laughs> shouldn't try, potentially disappoint people um because that makes me uh, asks no brings, you're hyping brings me up, yeah brings me back to the idea of the so the as we as we move forward into the future and there's this sort of popular idea of the world becoming a smaller place right as we as scientific advances uncover allow us to at least you know um in a empirical sense, understand more about our world and reality, if I can be so bold as to say that, uh, realizing I'm speaking to a philosopher. Um, I'm not going to say anything a student about it, of just, a student yeah. of philosoph philosophy. As technology comes forward, and and also as we talking about the idea of the negation or the or the loss of self, because mm -hmm. you know I think a lot of people from all sorts of of backgrounds and. Um, uh, schools of thought and, and political thought and so on would say that we're living in quite a self, uh, the age of self right now. Um, and who mm -hmm. knows whether that will be, you know, lean more in one direction or the other in the future. That's sort of something quite interesting to consider that as we at least in theory have even stronger or, or are encouraged to develop even stronger, more individual, individual identities, therefore, mm -hmm does then the idea of a cosmic horror of an impersonal reality uh, uh, wrecking or reality altering horror, you know, does it become more potent? I mean, is that why, why it seems like it's a, it's a genre that's, that seems to become going from strength to strength. I don't know. I mean, I'm not necessarily asking you I to mean, predict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't know either. And, uh, but yeah, I think that is an interesting observation for sure. Uh, I think that uh, 
it's not necessarily it doesn't necessarily becomes like scarier uh the way you describe it the, described it but uh, i think it's just that the tropes change to suit this kind of way of thinking now so that we find other ways to describe the cosmic horror itself and not necessarily make it impersonal but it attacks a different side of us as well I'm, I'm I'm not sure. It's an interesting question, and I don't really know how to answer it without just repeating what you just said. So, sure. No. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I mean it, it speaks. I'm sorry. It does speak of the evolution of the genre a little mm. bit. I guess what you, the way you described it, kind of, it's trying to constantly understand where humans are to attack them with something that's that will always feel alien, right? Yeah. Well, I mean. Yes, even and that, with such a technological, scientific, yada, yada, mm. uh, uh, kind of progress. Yeah, but, and I guess yeah. that's and I and I think again, and you know, when when this when cosmic horror kind of came into its own about a hundred years ago or so, it has often been preoccupied and concerned with you need to have a baseline of of a reality established in order for the sh in order for it to be shocking when it's disrupted i mean that's not to say that that is all cosmic horror is and, and should be you know you can have far Absolutely. more things that start I mean, from a very that, dream like yeah. fantastical i mean again not surreal but it treats with the notion of being able to travel across you know times and realities and there's there's a more romantic kind of nature to those stories right. i think dreams yeah. there's their own reality and yeah or maybe a border to another reality or a mm. place where you can understand the kind of reality yeah. that you can't understand with the conscious mind so mm. to speak of course being able to acknowledge that all genres need to be broad right to survive and and that's what makes them far more interesting you know rather than Definitely. there is no narrow set of you know, you can't tick off a list of criteria and say, oh, right, well, therefore we can slot this story into the cosmic horror genre. You know, all these things are only ever just useful kind of heuristics to to get Absolutely. an idea. Yeah. Um, and to subvert when you want to or to exactly. I don't know, heighten or do whatever. And that's just wish. what that's what makes fiction fun, just in general. Absolutely. You know, yeah. And that's I think the joy. I mean, that's the that's the fascinating thing. Um, is is ultimately why we find all these things, you know, why I know, at least speaking for myself, and I hope you'll maybe volunteer why you're drawn. I mean, one thing we, as humans, we, and I don't mean this in just the strict sense of juvenile, you know, like being silly or whatever, but we like to play, right? And whether play mm -hmm. means to literally just try and take our, take ourselves out of our own quotidian experience or, to just dip our toes into something either literally or, you know, or, or metaphorically. Do you remember your first, like the first time you read something? Cause I think we all like scary stories in childhood are, are kind of inextricably linked. Um, mm. But do you remember the first time you thought, Oh, this, this is a bit different. This is, you know, this isn't just like, Oh, there's, you know, there's this old house on the, you know, at the end of the street or, Okay. the forest is dark at night and that four evokes a shiver uh, you know when you the, the the kind of the the vastness and the impersonality that really just makes you feel that that particularly strange sensation that that i feel like cosmic horror singularly evokes do you remember when it was that you first encountered that i can't remember i uh I'm trying, but I can't. I, I do remember when I started reading Lovecraft, but I feel like that's a very kind of a cop out kind of answer to this very beautiful question, actually. Well, give, give but, let's let's go for the cop out anyway, and we don't have to use it. <laughs> of course, I was. Uh, I think I was about nineteen or twenty when I found a Serbian translation of a few of his stories, and I bought them, and I thought. Well, this is strange and unusual. I want to live in this world and see where it takes me. Then again, the, I don't think that wasn't uh, that, that didn't come from that place that you just described the the place of fear, the the place that inside of you that kind of makes you want to just go back. I think I I I already kind of intellectualized it a little bit too much. You know, I was at uni and I had opinions. I had I was reading a lot. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Um, Actually, like my first uh, really scary uh, experience or rather moment that I kind of remember 
isn't much a cosmic horror moment, but it is that moment of something lurking from the darkness. And it's something that's so ordinary as an object that eventually kind of becomes, I don't know, unacceptable to be a part of your life. And yet it's there all the time. So talking that's, about the uncanny, right? That's something incredibly off -kilter, mysterious. Something Okay. It's actually not that mysterious. It was basically uh, a girl that was older than me that was trying to scare me and make fun of me, basically, by telling me a story about fairies. I was probably very young. I don't remember how old mm. I was. But so if I was afraid of fairies and if, you, if uh, for instance, your audience is familiar, from, from familiar with the folklore of fairies and uh, fae folk and uh, the way they appear in fairy tales, they're not actually very amazing, beautiful no. creatures, but they're actually very scary and uh, and or ambiguous, right? Sure. So especially in like Macedonian folklore, they're pretty, pretty awful <laughs> mm. uh, creatures. And I think she told me something like, uh, when you sleep at night, fairies come into the photographs of your loved ones or your mother or whatever, and they look at you through the photographs oh and when God. they smile at you, you die or something like that. That That's, still scares me. That it's is so really strange. creepy. And it's got It's really creepy. It's got and tinges. It's so... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm interrupting your wonderful story. I was just going to say, that's also got tinges of like urban legend Style. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, and creepy pasta. Even. Yeah, yeah. I, you yeah. know, I, as much as it pains me to say, there's some really scary creepy pastas out there. There are um, really, truly. Mm. I mean, they are modern day folk tales, I guess. Um, uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I've, so, I've heard a lot of people kind of describe them as that, describe them that way, and I like it. I, mm. I agree. There is that thin line right between the absurd and and the scary and i think yeah and i think that was right. sort of my first encounter with it i mean that's where we also get and this is just sort of going way off topic into ideas of horror in general but you know of the course, notion but it also harkens back to cosmic horror as well and supernatural horror i think a mm. lot of authors and theoreticians speak about that kind of midline between something being kind of absurd and something mm. being super scary so that's kind of wider lovecraftian if you will i don't know genre of cosmic horror no that's very true i mean in fact the term used uh, you know the quote-unquote technical term um for people who have had alien encounters and experienced you know unusual phenomena is high strangeness um really yeah high strangeness uh, high strangeness never... yeah. yeah i think you if you look it up you'll you'll find you know there is sort of it's a it's used you know, fairly. I, found, um, I, I thought I was a connoisseur of this particular topic, but I guess. I'm oh, not. really? Oh, man, that's a, okay. That's a topic. That's a discussion for another time. Then, cool. Absolutely, yeah. But I guess it's that interesting question, right? The 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 negation or the annihilation of the self that happens to so many protagonists in you know in cos in the tales or secondary, you know, or the the described um, the person about whom the tale is being told. I suppose yes, and in, and in, in, in experience. So you mean first... like madness is that kind of madness being of the, the self, most yeah, or, of the self, yeah. Sort of. or or in or like when it manifests as the kind of body horror, you know, the physical changing. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. Um. Yes, I suppose I always thought reading Lovecraft or something, thinking, well, I love all the the antiquarian stuff and the the kind of the pseudo historiography and and the and the sort of scariness. I. But I always thought I hope that. You know, if if I could, yeah, okay, I wouldn't mind finding myself in this sort of really dire situation as long as I don't end up as some kind of gibbering. As long as I don't lose myself, I think it's the. I think why I enjoy reading them is you kind of get to go, you you get to be taken to the threshold, right? But right, you don't. Right, right. Have... But you're still safe. You don't have yeah. to transform into a hideous monster. Yeah. Yes, you know. Yes, when I read Lovecraft, but somehow no, when I was reading so the Southern Witch trilogy, hmm. something strange happened to me when I was reading the last book, which is actually called Acceptance, which I haven't that read. I would strongly recommend you read. It's, yes. Uh, have you read any of the books? Or I, I have only read the first in the trilogy. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I think the first one is the best one. Uh, but still, the third one kind of takes you takes you to a place where you kind of, at least took me to a place where I kind of I was like, maybe I do want to be this copy of this mm. brave new world that has like endless potential of being anything. And I kind of understood the title in that moment. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was it was a, because. 
the way that kind of uh, Jeff Van Dermeer treats it in comparison to Lovecraft, he gives it a kind of beauty and uh, to, to all this change and uh, kind of negation of the self. He gives it a, a kind of beauty because uh, he sees it as like a, con I think he understands it as a kind of continuation of life in a way. So it's a very vitalist kind of, I don't know, uh, vitalist fiction, I would call it. I don't know if that's a word you can use in English, actually, now that I think about it. I think I can understand what you mean. I mean, that's a fascinating... Like a life power, you know what I mean? Yes. Like a Elan Vital sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, pref I, I think I might even prefer it a little bit more to Love Lovecraft's kind of stance because... This kind of um, life-affirming acceptance of the change that happens within a Jeff Van Der Meer isn't less scary, but it's not a kind of um, end-all, ugly, uh, uh, ugly universe. But as scary as the universe is, there is still life and things are still happening and things do go on, even if we are just nothing within it. You know what I mean? To me, it seems like there's that difference between revulsion and I think acceptance, or yeah, it's it's the it's the it's the shrinking away from from the um, from the unknown and maybe even unknowable versus the the putting your hand out. I mean, is that in a in a very kind of simplistic way the difference or the right, right. the additional quality that is present in Vandermeer's work? I would say yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes, because um, I can't think off the top of my head. There are many, say, love yeah, maybe, uh, stories where someone voluntarily, I mean, uh, unless they are. I mean, listen, no one really volunteers in mm. Jeff Van Der Meer's stories either, no, except true. maybe one character in the second book, which I hope you will read. I, but, yeah, I, uh, I, I will. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the way they kind of accept this, uh, this new situation is very interesting and it's very different for every character, but... I don't know. I, I I always wondered at the end of that book, is it really now that we've accepted it a work of cosmic horror still? Mm. Can we leave place for beauty or even the sublime, which is something in, that interests me within aesthetics? But right. I don't know. Is is that maybe the new kind of the new way where um we're actually completely negating the self, even though we live in this time of the self, as you mentioned previously. Mm. and finding a kind of new philosophy maybe a kind of form of transhumanism even, without the negative connotations that it has gotten over the years yes okay we're going to take a very very quick break have a little bit of a musical interlude and then come back with the conclusion of the podcast don't go away
Okay, and we are back. So as we come to the end of this uh, this discussion, was there anything that, and then, you know, in thinking about what you wanted to talk about today or what you might be asked, anything that either I haven't asked you or that you would like to clarify any kind of, yeah, basically any little bits that might have been missed out that you um, would like to uh, speak on? Well, I feel like there are, that, that everything I might start speaking about uh, would uh, create an entire new discussion. Uh, but I would like to go back to something you mentioned actually previously, which is the idea of representation. Mm. Uh, the representation of the... We did uh, touch upon it a little bit, but the idea of uh, the representation of the cosmic horror within cosmic horror. And I just want to say I'm not going to open a too huge of a subject of the, uh, out of this but sure. I what I really love about cosmic horror and uh, what I find really interesting about it is how it can actually also change as a genre in different media to be its most potent self now sure you can say that about every genre of course and it feels obvious but within cosmic horror uh, representing the unpresentable which is what is essentially unpresentable uh, is, I don't know, I, I find the most intriguing, interesting part of the genre. So you can have uh, something like um, Carpenter's The Thing, where it's like super gory, or you can have something as beautiful as Annihilation, which is also, again, very a, a very gory film, but it has a kind of balletic beauty at the end uh, of the film that still is as terrifying as watching a spider head walk away from all of the characters. <laughs> so it kind of cosmic horror kind of, uh, I feel keeps artists at their toes to kind of find creative and interesting ways to show that which is unspeakable, right? And unpresentable and still keep it kind of fresh and interesting. So um, I just wanted to say that the representation again is very interesting in cosmic horror and should be, if artists are listening to your podcast, <laughs> eventually I hope they all kind of find their own way within the genre by finding another way of representing the cosmic horror, not just uh, thematically, but also aesthetically. Mm. And I think that breaks into also the idea of um, where where genre um, fiction can can actually be a really a useful or even just something a, a tool for the avant-garde right in art and media because if you're literally Absolutely. trying to depict or yeah depict or or um describe or circumscribe something that by its very definition you cannot do you know cannot be described or circum you know um yeah then then that leads you i'm sure if you know i'm not uh a visual artist myself but would lead you i imagine would lead you down into all sorts of kind of interesting avenues you know whether the medium representing the um the, in the intrusion into our reality itself you know breaks down or and sure you can you know the, 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 these things have been experimented with before in all sorts of ways you know like i mean even in something like gremlin yeah. have you like gremlins 2 yeah. where they fake out the film itself you know burning up at the beginning of the movie ah uh, the meta level yeah meta right so yeah, yeah. yeah i i just can't see it as anything but a use you know something that is is so worthwhile to engage with. I think that's what yeah, I it's almost like it's there to be broken and then put back together again. Yeah. And that and the great thing, and you could say this, I suspect, about most, you know, in my not having a, a, a really good overall understanding, but my gut feeling is you could say this about so many different kind almost almost all kinds of art. And the yeah, marvelous absolutely. thing about it is that it does not diminish uh, and well, ju I'm just going to say this and maybe it's not the most accurate, but I, I feel like it doesn't still doesn't diminish the potency of the idea of the genre because, you know, you can still, I'm sure like anything, we get jaded and we, um, you know, we, we, we don't necessarily look at something with fresh eyes. That's part of just being human. But, you know, Absolutely. you can, you can, uh, the, the wonderful thing about it, the grand thing about it, and I have to remind myself of this sometime, is that we can live in a world where you can pay like 20 bucks and buy a Cthulhu plushie, but you can also yeah. read, you go back and read these works. And as long as you kind of make, as you, as you have the will 
or to engage they can still be just as as horrifying as they were maybe not when you first read them but they never lose their power entirely which is reassuring i absolutely agree yeah mm. yeah definitely i think cosmic horror has still aged a little bit better than other forms of horror so absolutely especially when it comes to cosmic horror it's it, it's always nice to go back to the to its roots as it were well, that's and and I guess that's the fascinating thing. I mean, it's a trite uh, expression, but it's it's the thing of the the oak versus the reed, right? You know, the some things like say goth gothic fiction. I'm probably going to piss off people who know mu much more about this than I do, but it seems to me like so many of you know the the themes and and the ways in which a gothic story is expressed rests solely on some very very inflexible motifs and ideas um and so it's much harder to evoke those although <laughs> in saying that i think well then you can have gothic southern stuff and suburban gothic and so maybe that's absolutely. not really as true so maybe i'm just talking absolute nonsense and i have no idea what i mean but um as long as something exists there are ways to make it yeah that's very very true you can but kind of bend it into what you want it to yeah, be yeah that's guess. very true but yes i think maybe cosmic horror but there are more at the other, uh, on the other side there are things that are more pliable let's, mm, let's say yeah kind there's, of, there's find degrees. a mid midway between <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah hard to find absolutes yeah. but that's okay um absolutely, mm, absolutely. yes um <laughs> <laughs> the reason i'm talking to you is because uh i uh we have worked together on a youtube channel called the dark cosmos which uh, puts out a very a variable welter of excellent, um, mainly sci-fi based uh, horror with superb, rich audio visual storytelling. And it's just great. So have you got, I don't know, probably not allowed to like spoil anything you've got coming out. What's, what's your most recent story out on there and what might be coming up? Uh, well, um, my most recent story is actually, I think, um, The Time Jumper, mm -hmm. which is a story that, depending on how you want to uh, listen to it or understand it, it does have an element of cosmic horror within it, I think. Or at least that kind of um, unstoppable force bigger than anything you can imagine feeling about it. And certainly loss of self at various points absolutely loss of self but uh i have other stories coming out that are not necessarily cosmic horror but do evoke that kind of eerie uncanny feeling of being in a world that's not completely caring and mm. yet you have to face it so i don't have a specific story that i would like to talk about or plug but okay. uh, i would say take a look at the ca catalog of, of stories on the dark cosmos and not just mine but every writer uh, and there is there every really is or, i mean it's you know it's a comparatively young channel but there i would say there is almost if you're interested in anything slightly shivery or jittery there is pretty much something for everyone within Absolutely. the within the more like sci-fi based but you know you've got stories there that i would say are, are, are pretty much almost exclusively action stories um where the mm -hmm. horror is much much lighter and then you've got things that are um you know i would say a, um, a preponderance of of your stories tiana there is some of them become very ambiguous or you know sort right. of delving into again the idea of the the unknown or the loss of self some really cool collaborations on that channel as well all sorts and of course well, you're already listening to this on abominable, abominable abominations. God, I can't even say the name of my own fucking channel. Um, that's all right. That was that's yep. That was it's my. Bad. Oh, that's I've interesting. Got, uh, that could become like a running gag. Maybe it eventually just blah, 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 blah. Term, right? yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's what it is. It's it's a deliberate attempt to be charming. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it might be, uh, I might do something by Robert Chambers, something from The King in Yellow. Um, obviously, out of copyright is uh, is where I tend to look. I think it's, um, and I think it's about time to bring this jalopy to a shuddering halt. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak on the podcast today and express ideas and concepts much more coherently and eloquently than I ever could. Oh, I guess we better do like a little sign off. So I'll just, um, I'll say thank you for listening, everybody. And 
who knows what the dark and frightening future might hold. So I guess uh, goodbye for me. Thank you for listening and uh, hope you tune in for the next episode that Thomas has in store for you. Marvellous. Thank you so much. Righto. Thank you for listening to a slightly different episode of Bominable Bominations.